What's up, guys? Josh Pate here from 24-7 Sports. The social distance series rolls on. Today, we head out to SMU. Welcome in Mustangs head coach, Sonny Dykes. Coach Dykes, I'm not going to ask you the how are you doing right now with COVID, with quarantine, because everyone's answered that question and everyone says the same thing. But I guess I'll ask you this. Everyone has a unique story as to what their last four months has been like. So what has your last four months been like? Well, you know, everybody's got a different situation in their life right now. And, and mine is such that I've got a 11 and a nine year old daughter and a three year old little. And so we have been, you know, trying to parent and teach and, uh, you know, keep the kids from fighting all the time. And it's been a, it's been a really kind of unique time really for, for me. I just don't get to see my kids that much. I'm, I'm like every other college football coach or coach for that matter. Uh, across the country is you know we, we work a lot we have a lot of things going on we're probably around our players more than we are a family but I've gotten to spend a lot of quality time uh, you know with my girls and my little boy it's been great for my wife and I Kate to, to spend time together and so you know it's been one of those things that took some getting used to and and once we kind of found a groove uh, we, we figured it out and, and uh, so it's been it's been time that we'll never have an opportunity to do again probably and so <clears throat> We've tried to enjoy it. Done a lot of fishing with my, my three-year-old. Uh, my, my son loves to go fishing. And uh, we've got a couple of places basically we can walk to from our house and, and go, you know, catch some three or four inch fish, uh, <laughs> you know. And so anyway, it's been, it's been unique that way. You know, it's been hard though. You miss your players. I mean, I think that's the, the thing that, you know, I think we're all dealing with right now is just the fact that we're, we're accustomed to, you know, to be in a, a big part of our players' lives and, and them being a big part of ours. And we have, we have our players to our house, you know, regularly, and we just haven't been able to do that. And, you know, my kids miss having that connection with our players and, and having a relationship with them and my wife the same way. And so I think that part has been hard for us and I think maybe even harder than we expected. You know, just having all, the, all those young people in a room together and being able to look at them and, and – um, and try to, you know, try to affect them, especially with all the stuff that's going on in the world right now, just all the uncertainty and angst and, and different emotions that, that young people are going through right now. And so that part's been very difficult. You know, we've had Zoom meetings like everybody else, and but there's nothing like, you know, being able to, to be in front of your players and being able to have them in your office and close the door and talk to them about how they're doing and what's going on. And so that part's been challenging, but you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out ways just to get through it. You know, in our world, it's kind of funny. Everyone says, oh, nothing's going on right now. Spring ball was canceled for most teams, which would lead you to believe common sense would indicate, hey, that's just giving everyone more time to study up on teams for this coming year. But yet so everyone's kind of been so preoccupied with thinking about this that aside from like the top five or six teams in the country that everyone talks about, you go to a team like SMU, you guys are coming off a double-digit win season. You arguably have the best quarterback in your conference coming back, and I would second that sentiment. And you got a lot of energy there. Like, I would have to imagine, I mean, you guys ultra excited about what you have now if you do indeed get to play out a season or some semblance of a season this year. Yeah, I mean, I think that's um, that's one of the things that's been hard for us in some ways to deal with is just just what you said. I mean, we had a ton of momentum. Uh, coming out of last season, you know, our recruiting has has improved significantly. Uh, the the kind of players and uh, that we're able to recruit now, and guys that we're able to get in on and have a legitimate chance to get has has changed dramatically in a couple of years. Um, you know, we've been really fortunate with some high quality transfers as well that we've been able to add to our roster. So you know, we have probably about as much momentum really as anybody, and you hate to you hate to see you know the train get knocked off the tracks a little bit. Um, because what you try to do in college football is in business and everything else for that matter is, you know, you try to, to, you put in a lot of work, you do a lot of planning, you hope you can get everything lined up and then you hope you can execute a plan and have some success. And we were able to do it last year. And then you hope you can build off of that. And so, you know, with, with, with what we've had to deal with, um, uh, you know, with, with coronavirus, it has, it has, it feels like it's taken away a little bit of our momentum. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of positive things happening, uh, especially, like I said, especially with our current players, just the roster that we have coming back. We feel really good about 
about our roster. We've added some really important pieces to the puzzle that we're very excited about. Uh, you know, we have a, a fantastic quarterback in Shane Bouchelle to build around. Um, and then, you know, and then we're recruiting at a really high level right now. And so lots of positive things right now. You know, our hope is to, to get on the field and, and, you know, reap the benefits of all the, the planning and the hard work. Um, you know, I feel really bad for our players right now. You know, these are young people that are having to deal with issues that I think none of them ever thought they would have to deal with. Um, you know, and guys that have been working their whole lives to be able to play their senior year in college. And, and there's just a lot of uncertainty with those guys. And I think it's, you know, it's hard on them. It just is, especially, you know, when you're 18 to 22 years old and you don't really have a lot of frame of reference to, uh, to, to deal with and to, to look back at. But, you know, uh, but we're excited about, about our program. We're excited about where this thing's headed. You know, I think that typically when you take a job someplace, you know, you get there and you go, whoa, this is going to be a little more difficult than I thought. Uh, just because there's, you know, there's always some things that, that make jobs difficult that you don't really know about until you get there. But the great thing about SMU is it's been better. Everything's been better than I expected. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that the support from our administration has been better than I expected. Uh, the support from our community and donors has been better than I expected. Our ability to recruit has been better than expected. Uh, our players have been fantastic in terms of just, you know, doing everything we ask them to do and then some. Uh, we have a real unique football team just in terms of their maturity, uh, their work ethic, just what kind of people they are, their character. And so, you know, we're hoping we get to play because I really do think in, you know, in my career, this has a chance to be one of those really special teams because, you know, we've got a lot of good football players, but most importantly, we have a lot of great leadership and we've got a lot of guys that really care, really like each other, really like going to school at SMU and really like you know, playing hard for each other on Saturday. So, you know, I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to play this year because I think we've, we've got a unique opportunity to have a really special season. And, um, you know, and, and we just got to do a good job of, of just focusing on what we can focus on. And, you know, and that's prepare like we're going to have a season and then make adjustments if we don't. I was excited uh, when we were able to get you on board to do this. And we appreciate you being here, by the way. I was excited because I thought I remembered – Yes, you were on those Texas Tech staffs in the early 2000s. And yes, it overlapped with a period of time where I took a a mission trip, a church mission trip out to Lubbock. And I was in high school at the time. I think I was a freshman in high school. And I mean, I watched college football, but I didn't watch nationwide. I'm from the South. I watched SEC ball. So I go out to Lubbock. And everyone in town, obviously, is diehard Red Raider. And they were telling me about this program. And they were telling me about this Mike Leach guy and this offense they were running, which sounded nothing like what I experienced on Saturdays in the fall. And so, you know, I took that SEC attitude out there and I just kind of scoffed and said, oh, that's not how we do it down there. And then I hit the fast forward button 20 years and everyone's incorporating those principles and they've long since incorporated those principles. I mean, when, when you guys talk amongst yourselves, when you're off the record, when you're sitting around a campfire, just, just texting back and forth, it's gotta be some validation to see people doing at the highest level of the sport today what you've been doing for decades now. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. We used to, you know, people used to refer to it as the gimmick offense, you know, and, and so we used to laugh a little bit about, about what that meant and, and just really kind of laugh about the lack of knowledge, uh, you know, when it came to, to, to understanding kind of what was going on and, and, and really people that were in the football community, whether it was sports writers or, or, you know, pundits that talked about football where, you know, they thought that the the air raid, which I was really fortunate to hook up with Hal Mummy and Mike Leach and those guys all the way back in 97 at Kentucky is kind of when I got my start with, with Mike. I was Mike's GA in 97 and, and, um, and had a chance to work with Hal, who, you know, Hal is really the guy that put this whole thing together. And then Mike took it and put his version of it together at Texas Tech. And I was fortunate enough to go with Mike to Texas Tech in 2000 and be there until 2007. So, you know, I was lucky to learn the air raid from the, the real air raid guys. And, but what, what the misconception was out there, that, that somehow it was about plays and it was never about plays. It was all about, you know, fundamentals. And I think people, people just thought that, that, you know, we were run, ma- running these magical plays and that we were, you know, doing these things that, that were different than what everybody else is doing. And what we were doing actually was, we were much more simple than everybody else was. It was an execution-based offense where, you know, we we had adjustments um, to whatever defense, you know, people ran against us, whether it was up front or whether it was on the back end. 
And it was all about, you know, being able to go out and execute and, you know, and then allow players to do what they did well. And so it was a different way of doing what had always been done in football, but somehow people seemed to dismiss it for a long time. And then, you know, and then one day we woke up in the big 12 and, and took a look around and everybody in the league was doing it. And so, and the offense in, in that league went from a, you know, an I formation pounded out, grinded out football league to a wide open league that, that everybody, you know, had fun watching. And so it was, it was fun to be part of it. And then, you know, we used to laugh about it. And, you know, we would talk to people about, you know, someday you're going to see this in the NFL and same thing people laughed and scoffed. And, and I mean, now it's, you know, if you don't see it in the NFL, then you're behind. And so it's, it's been interesting to watch the evolution of it all. And it's been fun to be a part of it. And, you know, I had a chance to work with some, some really, really good football coaches, some really smart guys. But the best thing you could say about all of them was that they were, you know, they were risk takers. They had to have a lot of, a lot of self-confidence to do it. You know, I can remember, uh, you know, going to Kentucky in 97 and we're getting ready to play Louisville the first game of the season. And, and, you know, just me being new to the air raid going into that first game thinking, you know, we're going to get stomped because we hadn't tackled in practice and we, we had so few plays and, and then watching the whole thing work and come into fruition, score all these points and, and just be a part of something that was really exciting. So it was a great learning experience for me, and it was exciting to be part of the change, I think, not only in college football, but really uh, the way football is played at every level. Um, it permeated down to the high schools quickly, and, and those high school coaches adapted really, really fast and, and, um, and started running it, you know, incredibly well uh, because those guys understood the fundamental part of, 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 the, of the offense and the simplicity of it. And, and they did a great job of teaching it to their players. And so, anyway, it's been a, it's been a fun ride uh, to, to do it for, you know, going on almost 30 years now and, and just, uh, or I guess, 20, 25 years almost. And so it's just been, uh, been fun to be, be part of it. You mentioned the word evolution offensively. And, I mean, you got evolution as a person, evolution as a coach. You got your first full-time gig, I think, about a decade later in 2010. You were at Louisiana Tech. And so you've been a head coach now for quite a while. And I'm always very curious. I ask as many guys as I can this question. The perception you had about how you thought it was going to go the first time you took a head coaching job versus how it actually has gone, the unforeseen twists and turns, how you think you've personally evolved, how have things unfolded, maybe specifically in ways that you never could have envisioned when you first got your start? Well, I mean, the funny thing about it is you have a plan. Um, you know, it's like anything else, you can kind of plan for it and you hope that you get that opportunity. And when you get the opportunity, you walk in, you have this plan. And then from day one, you realize you need to throw that in the trash as fast as possible. Uh, because, you know, every job is different. Every challenge is different. Every situation is different. Every place has strengths and every place has weaknesses. And, you know, I, I tell the story a lot, but it's, I think it's a great, um, you know, it, I think it's a great story that kind of epitomizes what you talked about. You know, I, I go to Louisiana Tech, and, and, you know, I'd been in Texas recruiting for a long time. I grew up in Texas. I knew a lot of high school coaches in Texas. So my thought was, well, you know, I'm three hours from Dallas. I'm not that far from Houston. We'll be able to go to, to Dallas and Houston, and we'll recruit these, these players from there and, and recruit the state of Louisiana. And, and, you know, these kids will love it, and they'll have a great experience, and we'll be able to, to win all these games with these, you know, big city kids. Well, I get to Ruston, and Ruston's a small town, and I get to Louisiana Tech, and it's a small college. and you know, we start coming to Dallas to recruit and we get these kids on visits and, and they come to Ruston and, you know, and, and, you know, at the end of their visit, they say, well, coach, we had a great experience. It was awesome. We love your vision. But I mean, I just don't know if I can live in Ruston, you know? And so we had to completely shift everything. And, and, and oh, by the way, our high school facilities are better than the facilities you have at Louisiana Tech at that time. And so, it was, we had to completely change and we had to change to, okay, look, we got to, we have to go market ourselves to, to people that are going to be interested in buying our product. And so, you know, we started rec recruiting small towns and rural kids and, and there's so many good high school football players in small towns in Louisiana and Mississippi and East Texas and, and all the different places. And they loved Ruston, you know, they could relate to it. It appealed to them. And we were able to find a lot of really, really good football players. And, and some of those recruiting classes we had at Louisiana Tech were some of the very best, you know, classes with Vernon Butler, who went on to be a first-round draft pick, and Vontarius Dora, who went on to be like a third-round pick. And uh, we just had a lot of really – Kenneth Dixon, who I believe was a second-round pick. <clears throat> so we just recruited some really good players from some 
really small rural towns and and we learned at that point hey look that's what's gonna that's what's gonna appeal um you know to, to the kids that we need to recruit and you know one of the big selling points we had at that time in Ruston was we were opening a uh, um a Chili's you know and that was a part of our recruiting was hey man we have a Chili's you know and and sometimes that was a big deal to some of those kids because they lived in a small town that didn't have a Chili's and so that became a big recruiting pitch and and you know, and as, as the program improved, you know, they built some unbelievable facilities now at La Tech. And, you know, for that level of football, they probably have about as good of facilities as anybody. And Skip Holtz has done a great job building uh, and, and continues to have a lot of success. And it ended up being a great place to, to get started. Uh, great people. Met some of my best friends to this day in Ruston. And I uh, had a great experience there. And, and like I said, coached a lot of players that actually coached for me now here at SMU. And so it was a great place to start, but you learn a lot, you know, you really do. And, and, and then, you know, I, I made the biggest change possible. I go from Ruston, Louisiana, small town, um, you know, to, to Cal, to Berkeley. And you talk about a night and day. I mean, that was completely different and, and trying to kind of rebuild that program. And you know, that deal didn't end the way we wanted it to, but I was really proud of the success we had. You know, we, Started with one win, went to five wins, went to eight wins, had the first pick in the draft, uh, won a bowl game for the first time in a while. Um, you know, and so I was really proud of, of, of what we built there at, at, at Cal as well, fixed the academics um, that, that had been a kind of a, a disaster before. And so anyway, you, you, learn, you live and you learn and you have to adjust. And what I love about where I am is that, um, you know, I'm home. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm comfortable here. My wife's comfortable here. My family's comfortable here. We understand the ins and outs of Dallas and, and the recruiting and, and have a lot of relationships here. And so, you know, for us, this has just been a, a dream come true and a great move for us. It's really interesting. You talk about a lot of that and how you evolve and how you change your perspective. When you get to be a head coach, you add a thousand responsibilities on your plate that maybe you don't even know exist if you're a coordinator or if you're a wide receivers coach, what have you. And so, I've always been, you know, very fascinated in the fact that you don't get more hours in your day. You still have 24, just like you did before, but you got all these responsibilities and you're also expected to stay at the cutting edge of the evolution of the game. And so when you talk about continuing to grow as a head coach, A, how do you find time to do that? B, right. how do you do it? I know a lot of guys love to go to as many clinics as they can. Some guys love to read as much as they can. I've always been fascinated at the stories about staffs going to meet with other staffs in the off season. And then other guys, maybe all the above, where do you fall on that? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think the one thing that I learned pretty quickly is that, you know, you don't have more time in the day. And so your focus has to go from, you know, from football really to people. I think that's the, that's the deal as a head coach is, you know, I, I don't spend near as much time on actual football as, is as, as I'd like to, but, you know, the thing that's much more important um, is just people, whether it's, it's your coaches, whether it's your players, whether it's your players' families, uh, whether it's your support staff, whatever it is, you know, my job is to, um, is to take care of those folks, whether it's our 130 players or, or the 40 people that work for us in, in football. Um, you know, all of them are, are my family. And so that's what I do is, is I, I'm in the people business. And so that's what I try to do is, is, is make sure that, um, you know, we're providing the resources so that everybody can be successful, you know, that, that at the same time, everybody knows that this is a business, but at the end of the day, it's really about, uh, about doing it together and doing it as a family. Um, you know, and I think that's really, really important, especially for young people these days is just, you know, knowing that when they go off to college someplace, they're not just, um, a football player, that they're also a student and, and a son and, um, you know, and a grandson and, and somebody's nephew and, and somebody's cousin, and, and they're part of our family. So that's, that's where I spend most of my time really every day is, is talking to my players, talking to my coaches, uh, trying to help them uh, with issues or problems that arise in their lives. You know, I love the game of football. I, I love X's and O's. Um, you know, I miss being able to devote a lot of my attention to that. You know, as a coordinator, you can kind of walk into a room, close the door, you know, and spend 12 hours on a game plan and walk out. And now you just can't do that as a head coach. You know, you're getting pulled so many different directions and, and that's okay. I and mean, that's what you sign up for. And, and I think that's one of my strengths anyway, is to, to be able to listen to folks and be able to communicate with them and to, to try to be able to, to help and empathize and, 
and at the same time, you know, build a culture within a program. Because, look, at the end of the day, you know, players come and go. And, and uh, you know, culture is what really sustains your program. You know, the players are the most important part of it, without a doubt. But, but that culture, if you can get the culture right, the culture will outlast the coaches, the players, everybody. And, you know, I learned a great lesson way back when at Texas Tech. Um, you know, we got there in 2000. Cliff Kingsbury had played one year as a college quarterback at that point. And uh, so we get there and, and, you know, I can remember Cliff being the first guy in the office. I mean, he was there hours before any of the coaches were. And then I can remember when we left at night, Cliff was still in the office watching film. And, you know, I just remember what that did is that set a standard for every other quarterback that came after him. Sonny Cumbie was the next guy. So Sonny was the first guy in, the last guy to leave. You know, then after that, it was, it was Cody Hodges. And then it was B.J. Simmons. And then it was Graham Harrell. And all those guys, you know, had this work ethic that was unparalleled. And it's just part, it was just part of the experience of being a quarterback at Texas Tech. And if you look at those guys, I mean, obviously Cliff's done incredibly well. You know, as the head coach of the Cardinals, Graham's the offensive coordinator at USC. Sonny Cumbie's now the offensive coordinator at TCU. You know, all those guys have had great uh, college coaching careers. It's because they learned a work ethic and, uh, and a methodical approach from Cliff. And, you know, it's so funny. That was 20 years ago. And that culture still exists. And there's been four or five head coaches since then or three or four head coaches since then. And, uh, but that quarterback culture and that expectation to work that hard um, and to be that kind of leader still exists in Lubbock today. And it's, it's you know, everybody's reaped tremendous benefits for, from that. And so that's, that's my job, really, is to create the culture, to build the culture, and to, and to maintain the culture. I'll get you out of here on this, Coach. I did want to ask one more question that you just hit on. I don't think I've ever heard a coach say this before. You mentioned having a culture in place there in Lubbock, especially in the quarterback room, that was so strong and guys developed such great habits that they translated to being a coach later down the road. Now, pretty much everyone wants to play ball and they want to play pro ball, or most people have aspirations of that when they come to college. But I'm really curious, have you ever incorporated in your recruiting approach to the high school level, selling guys on the idea that we have a culture in place that's not only going to hopefully prepare you for the next level, but it also gets you ready if you ever want a future in coaching in this sport to where you could maybe explore that route too. Yeah. I mean, I think all you have to do is, is look at the coaching staff we have here at SMU. I mean, you know, Trey Haverty coaches are, are uh, safeties. Our Trey was a, was a, a player that I recruited at Texas Tech. Kevin Curtis was a player that my dad recruited to Texas Tech that, uh, you know, coaches our corners. Um, you know, uh, David Grew coaches our wide receivers. David Grew played for me at La Tech. Colby Cameron uh, is, a, is a QC for us. Colby was our quarterback at La Tech that, you know, had all that success way back when. Um, and so, you know, Steph McClure played for me at Cal, who is, uh, is one of our graduate assistants here, who's got a really bright future in coaching. And so, you know, this, certainly that's something that we talk about is, is just, look, here's, here's kind of the relationship that you can expect if you'll come to SMU. You know, we're going to expect you to work hard. We're going to expect you to, to love football. And, and that's one thing that all of those guys that I talked about have in common is they have a deep love and respect for the game of football. And they know that, that they've gotten a whole lot more out of it than they put into it. Um, we all have. You know, we've all been really lucky to get what we want, get to do what we want to do for a living because not many people really get to do that. And, and so, um, you know, I think that for, for us, from a recruiting standpoint, we talk about it all the time. You know, we, 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 we talk to our guys. We just said, look, look at all the people that were former players. You know, Miles White works for us, was another wide receiver at Louisiana Tech. You know, we just have a ton of guys in our program that, that are coaching for us now, that work for us, that, um, you know, that, that came up in the ranks and, and had that same thing, had a love for the game, had a passion for, for coaching. Um, you know, I think felt like that coaches had a positive impact in their life, and, and now they wanted to get into that profession where they could – try to have that same impact in, in other people's lives. And so that's what's fun about, uh, uh, about coaching is you really do. People kind of laugh at it and people make fun of it. And, and people, I think, uh, cliche it a little bit, but you can really make a difference in young people's lives. And, and at the end of the day, you know, that's really what this whole thing is about. You know, it's, it's, it's great. You know, coaches nowadays get paid more money than we should. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of benefits to coaching, but, 
you know, I mean, look, I started, I started as a high school coach. My second job was at Navarro junior college for $3,000 a year. And then I got a raise to $4,000 a year. So I didn't get in it for the money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I don't think any of us do, you know, I don't think any of us ever assume that, you know, we're going to, we're going to make a bunch of money in this profession. And, and so, you know, it's really about, we love football. We love young people. We love trying to make a difference. And, and, you know, if you're kind of in the right place at the right time, then maybe someplace down the road, that'll come too. But I think all of these guys feel the same way. They, they love the game. They love young people. They want to help. And so, you know, I think it's been, it's been really fun to watch them grow. I mean, there's nothing more rewarding in the world to, to have these young guys in the room and you can look at them and you can say, you know what, I made a big difference in this guy's life. Uh, because, I mean, at the end of the day, that's a whole lot more important than what kind of car do you drive. That is awesome stuff. We really appreciate it, Coach. Sonny Dykes, head coach at SMU, joining us. I asked for 15 minutes. He gave us darn near 30 and never complained a single time. Coach, really appreciate it. I wish you guys the best of luck and hope we do get to see you on the field this fall. No problem. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, sir.